Are you ready to embark on an adventure through the world of words? Join us on The Reading Revolution and let's explore the exciting world of literacy together. Welcome to this episode of The Reading Revolution powered by bookvending.com. I am your host, Josh Gregory. Very excited for this episode, the first time that we are on location and not in our studio or doing a Zoom call. So it's excellent that we're here. We're very happy that we've been invited to Buffalo Public School 61, Arthur O. Eve, School of Distinction. And my guest today is Principal Nathaniel Barnes. Thank you so much for joining us on The Reading Revolution. Good evening. Thank you for having me and having the podcast here at our school. We appreciate it. And we've got a lot to talk about. Obviously, we've got a machine in the back, something that happened in September and about a year or five and a half years ago, how this whole program with Inchi the Bookworm and his journey started. So we're really excited about what we're going to be talking about today. Likewise. So. Let's start off with uh, your background, how you came into education, and what were the decisions that led you to say, hey, I want to be an educator? Oh, that's a great question. So I determined that I wanted to be a teacher around third grade. Um, what many may or may not know about me is in third grade, I was uh, identified as a student with learning disabilities, and um, I overheard um, a teacher speaking to my mother saying, I don't know what else we can do. For Nate. And uh, she wasn't trying to be difficult. She genuinely didn't know what else she could do. And then at that point, I made up my mind. I said, I'm going to be a teacher because I have to make sure other kids don't hear their teacher saying that to their parents. So I knew at that point I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and teachers were what I was around every day of my school age career, if you will. So I was inspired. Um, as a child, in my primary years, I used to play school. Um, when I was uh, in high school, my senior year of high school, um, I think the practice is still followed today. If you get so many credits by the time you're a senior, you get a shortened day senior year. It's like a big, a big, a big positive, right? So my senior year of high school, we had half day. And what I would do is because the elementary school of the district I attended was on the same campus of my high school, I would leave around 12 o'clock. And I would go over to the elementary school and I would do an internship with fourth grade students with a teacher who was once my teacher. Um, and then after that, I went on to Medi College uh, to become an elementary teacher. Uh, my bachelor's is in uh, childhood education. Um, as I chaired, I was a student with learning disabilities. I struggled big time with reading um, in my primary and adolescence years in full transparency. So about my sophomore year of college, I said, you know, how am I going to be a teacher when I struggle with reading myself? So when I was blessed to be able to obtain my bachelor's degree, I went back to school for a master's degree in literacy, which really focuses on teaching students how to read. Um, and I was able to obtain that credential, which uh, qualified me to be able to be a reading specialist, as well as a, a literacy coach to work with teachers on how to teach students how to read. Um, so I, I started my career as a third grade teacher, a, a one-year long-term substitute position in uh, Chictawaga, which is where I attended. Um, after that, I moved away to Baltimore, Maryland, where I taught uh, first grade at private and public schools. I moved back to Buffalo and became a first grade teacher in Buffalo. Um, then I started to execute my literacy credentials uh, to a higher degree, if you will. I became a literacy coach. So in that role, it's a quasi-leadership role uh, that serves as a conduit between administration and teachers to support teachers on effective teaching strategies um, and execute the principal's vision, if you will, as it relates to district expectations and their building expectations. Um, while doing that role, I, I, I realized that I liked leadership, so I went back to school to become, uh, to get credential to be a building administrator. Um, after receiving those credentials, um, I started to work as um, an assistant principal and director of curriculum at a local charter school. Um, I went on to become the principal of that charter school um, I also started to work as an adjunct instructor, so I started to teach other educational professionals who wanted to go back to school to be administrators at Canisius College, an adjunct instructor at Madai College for future teachers as well. Um, I then later became the founding principal of a local charter school, so I, I did all of the founding work um, connected to uh, supporting with writing the curriculum, um, the onboarding of teachers, coming up with a professional development plan and things of that nature. And uh, to fast forward, I'm now the principal here at this wonderful school, Arthur Eve School of Distinction, which is a very um, interesting school because it's programming within the building. We have specialized programming. We have an arts 
integration programming, an exploratory arts program, in which all of our students can participate in dance, theater, visual art, vocal, and violin. And then we also have a criterion-based component, which is a gifted and talented program that those students have to take a qualifying test to be a part of, and then they feed into our 5 through 12 gifted and talented building Olmstead in the district after they leave here. So that's kind of my educational and professional journey in a nutshell. <laughs> so when you decided to leave the classroom setting and get into leadership, there still has to be, and maybe I'm crazy to say this, but that yearning to be back in the classroom, how do you do that on a day-to-day -day basis if you can to not just be the, the leader of the school, but also someone who is welcome in those classrooms? That's a great question. So the primary responsibility of a building principal and an assistant principal is to be the instructional leaders of the building. And in order to instructionally lead the building, you have to have a pulse on the instruction that's happening. Um, so as I shared, I have a background in literacy, and our assistant principal we have a back, has a background in math, so it strikes a happy balance. And one of the things that our district has in place, which helps administrators instructionally lead effectively, is something that's called instructional walkthroughs. So we have instructional priorities for the areas of English language arts and the areas of math. And one of the instructional priorities, specifically for English language arts, is all students read. So we have look for us, if you will, as to what does all students read look like in the classroom. And that gives us the opportunity as administrators to go in and with a very uh, you know, close lens, look at the work that students are doing connected to reading, provide feedback to teachers, have some collaborative conversation, and use our, our background, our experiences, our expertise, and our credentials to further support and develop the teachers in that area or to give them ideas on ways to maximize the work they're doing that's aligned to best practices, um, as well as it serves as a continual opportunity to build relationships with, with students. And the work that they're doing serves as the nucleus of that relationship between the students, administrators, and teachers, because that's the, the, the center of what's common between all those different stakeholders, if you will. So again, we as well enjoy how beautiful this machine is. Yes. This Inchi uh, bookworm program started here in uh, five and a half years ago with the very first book machine, a book vending machine that ever existed. It came Correct. out of this school. So when you came in and took over the leadership, you were aware of this machine being here and its legacy before you said, hey, I'm grabbing these reins? I, I was. So um, one of the things when I was... Uh, appointed and assigned to this school, uh, the school has always had a very robust website. So I did some research, and one of the things that was on the website was the whole book vending machine initiative. And uh, that initiative, I must say, was started by my predecessor, Mrs. Walker, who's now retired. So when I came here, I said, you know, you have to tell me all about this book vending machine. And she gave me some insight. She said, you know, a few years ago, I had this idea of a book um, a book vending machine, and she spoke about that idea with her then assistant principal who had some experience with book vending machines at another place, um, and they implemented it here. And one of the things that she put in place that I carried over um, into my principalship is the principal's reading challenge. And what that looked like and looks like now is each month we encourage our students to read 10 books or 10 chapters. And that number is based on the fact that all of our students, we encourage them to read 15 minutes per night. So if they're reading 15 minutes per night, 10 books or 10 chapters for the adolescent students can easily be obtained, if you will. So we have this one principal's reading log, and it's housed outside of the library because the book vending machine, the beautiful book vending machine is inside the library. And uh, at the beginning of every month, we send the logs home with the students. We keep them, as I said, outside of the library and on our welcome table in case they get misplaced. And as they read books or as they read chapters or their parents read to them for the students that are our youngest students, like pre-K students, parents are able to write the titles or the chapters of those books down on the logs and sign off on them. And they're turned into the building. So they go to our, our literacy coach and our literacy coach vet to make sure the expectation was met, the 10 books or 10 chapters. And each month at the beginning of the month, we make a big deal and we call all the names of the students who've met that goal over the announcements. They get to come down to the uh, library, they get a golden coin, and they get to select the book that they want to read. And then they that book serves as the first book to go in their log for the next month. So it's a way to build an intrinsic as well as extrinsic, if you will, love for reading 
Um, and it worked for the former principal. I thought it was uh, brilliant. I upheld it, and it's continued to work. So that's one of the things that we've done here, how we've incorporated it into our programming, into the expectations we have for students so that it it's fun and so that they have some collective efficacy connected to it. And we're in a library where a student can come in and take out a book or two, ten, how many ever they want to. What's the excitement behind a student actually selecting a book that they know they're going to actually keep and not have to just lend and bring back? Well, the excitement about it is, one, I know that this book gets to go on my lock for me to get another one next year, next month. So the goal is we want to have programming in place where that every student by the end of the school year can have their own library of minimally 10 books if you met the expectation each month. In addition, the excitement is, is when students come to the library, they have scheduled times. They get to take out books, but those books have to be returned, right? And what if I really wanted to read this book again? So they get to have this visual reminder that if I'm reading my expectations of 10 chapters or 10 books per month, I always will get to select a book that I get to keep. So although I may have a variety of books that I can choose from in the library that has to, that has to be returned, each month I get a book that's mine. And that builds their excitement, um, that builds their love for reading, um, and that builds their desire to be in the library where the books are. <laughs> How important in your estimation is it for the families to be involved with reading starting at a young age instead of the old, well, that's what schools are for. You're supposed to teach our kids to read. It's vital, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, the old times saying that parents are the first teachers is 100% true. So if parents are involved in reading and they're reading to their children and they're exposing their children to text, one of the tips I gave my, uh, my parents on our life the other day is when you're driving down the highway and you see a billboard, read the billboard to your child and talk about it, right? Um, if you're in the house and you're eating breakfast, put the cereal box in front of them and let them look at the ads. If you build that type of excitement for students around reading that is um, not structured, if you will, when they have to read to perform a task in class, it's not daunting and they're more, uh, they're, they're more likely to be able to do so successfully and willingly because the willingness has a lot to do with the performance, right? So if I'm disgruntled, I'm already at a disadvantage of how well I'm going to perform. So the parents' involvement is key, but the schools do have a responsibility and parents understanding that. So we have to build initiatives and things in place that also excites the parents about it. So in addition to the book vending machine, just one example, one of the things we do is we do a monthly mystery reader where each classroom picks a parent once per month to be the mystery reader. That teacher gives the students different clues about the parents throughout the month and they try to figure out who's that parent and on the day of the parent comes in and reveals themselves and read a story they select well if their child won a coin and was able to get a book out of the book vending machine and their parent is the mystery reader the parent may come in with that book and read it to the entire class so it's all interconnected so with with test scores and reading and literacy we know we see all these statistics about how this country is really struggling in all their efforts and that sort of thing. What kind of challenges are families facing when, and a lot of times you think, well, can't you just read all those things that you just said, cereal box, a billboard, kind of generate that excitement about reading. What are the families facing that are struggling with getting kids to start reading? I think um, with education or knowledge, right? Yeah. Um, so one of the things I say is if I go into a procedure room at a hospital and a doctor is performing surgery, I'm going to have no idea what's happening unless I'm educated on it. So that which is second nature or innate to us as education practitioners, because that's what we do, you can't expect that to be the case for the population that you serve. Sure. So as I shared, you have to, one thing is every parent want their child to succeed, right? But we have to come up with innovative and equitable ways in, for, in order for all parents to engage. So it's our job to come up with initiatives that engages the family, but simultaneously shows them the importance of that engagement. Um, and those initiatives then not only need to engage, but needs to educate, right? So if I have a mystery reader and I'm walking in the room and I see all the kids jumping up and down and excited that I'm reading to them, I then see, say that this is something I need to turn key in my home. So we just have to be really metacognitive and reflective on how we do it so that we are building a love for reading, 
getting books in children's hands, but also ensure that parents are understanding the importance of simultaneously. Because traditional, here's a packet of why you should do this, may not work for everyone. So we have to come up with ways that work for everyone. The traditional packet of this is why you should do it isn't bad, but what are we going to do in addition to that for the parent that doesn't read that packet? So really when we talk about you never stop learning, sometimes we have to teach those who thought they've been taught everything already. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. Because I know how to read doesn't mean I know how to teach a child how to read, right? And I know when I was in school, we were taught certain words that you just need to know that this is the word yellow and that's just the end of it, right? Um, But there is actually um, a systematic approach to teaching students how to read, right? And there are initiatives and systems and and things of that nature that parents can engage their children in that parallels to that systematic approach we take at school. Um, But again, we have to be innovative in how we roll those out and how we build collective efficacy with the at-home connection for those things to be paralleled. And then you'll see the, uh, the fruit of that um, at, as it relates to student achievement in school. So when we're on the topic of statistics and you know literacy, where it stands in this country, can you talk a little bit about the successes that you've seen here at the Arthur O. Eve School? Yes, I, I can. I am so grateful to God to say that we have made some progress. Um, This year, on the 2023 New York State ELA assessments, our ELA scores jumped 14%, which was pretty amazing. And I'd be remiss if I did not credit the work of the teachers, right? Uh, What what I tell them is I facilitate, but they do the work, right? Um, In addition to that, in addition to the New York State assessments, we have building level assessments. So we use something in-house that's called Dibbles which kind of gives us a pulse on students' reading level and kind of helps us drive our instruction. So when our intermediate students take those state assessments, their performance is optimal. Um, And we were very fortunate to uh, stumble upon an investigative post um, released by the uh, Buffalo News um, outlining the fact that our our Dibble scores for the fall of 2023 were the highest they've been in seven years, which we were very excited with that about that considering we're just three years back after COVID as well. And and, and again, it shows when you're strategic about instruction, when you're strategic about initiatives, you get buy-in from all stakeholders and that formula or that uh, equation equals academic achievement. (laughs) You know, you mentioned COVID and I think it's a foregone conclusion that everyone says education was hurt very much so by kids not being in a classroom and not being around their peers and instructors. Looking back on that, what kind of lessons did you learn from what you were doing that was successful and how we could actually jump ahead and even do do more and do better, knowing that you just went through this awful time? What do we need to do to get back and hit the round running or hit the ground running and 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 maintain the high level of education we were doing before kids were trying to do everything from home remotely? Well, in full transparency. We've been back in the buildings now probably close over two years, Mm -hmm. so everyone should be on the ground running. Sure. Okay. Um, And they really should have been on the ground running the first day we got back. And and, and, um, I would imagine that every school system and district was. Uh, But what COVID taught us here at the Home of the Arts is that students are resilient, and regardless of what they missed, it, it does not fully... Um, they, what they can do is not fully contingent upon what they missed, right? Um, and what it has helped us to understand is the importance of reflection because it caused us to have to sit back and say, we have to do some things differently to fill this achievement gap. Um, to, we have third graders who haven't been to school since they were in first grade when they were, when they were supposed to learn how to read. So it helped us to understand the importance of reflection and really value the word innovation. Um, And when we talk about the word innovation, some of those initiatives that we reference that we have in the building and some that we connect to the book vending machine are a part of that innovation of building a love and a a collective um, joy around learning. Um, And two two years later, we're we're grateful that we've seen the fruit of that. (laughs) So in, in earlier this, fall, this past fall, when we unveiled 
the new machine, which was so much fun to do and have sure was. and have you know the, the you know the, the board president was here and, and and the superintendent was here. It was a great great afternoon. The excitement of the kids. When kids see that, is there a level of even at that young age of hmm, you know I see a level of investment from this school in my education when they see a machine like this placed in their library. Absolutely. Um, our students, what we do is we consider the gifts. When, when they get the golden coin, we consider those books gifts to them, right? And we have time set aside in the day when teachers are doing small group instruction and things like that, when students can read independently, right? And that's when they're able to read their book that they got out of the book vending machine, right? And they see it as an investment because they understand that a vending machine, you have to use money. They go to Tops, they go to Wegmans, they go to Target, and they see the soda in the machine, or they see the candy bar, and they know it costs a dollar. And if mommy or daddy doesn't give me a dollar, I can't get that. But if they give me a dollar, they... They they have the resources. I did something well. I deserve it. So that directly transfers to the book vending machine, where if I'm able to get a book out of class, even if I didn't do as well on something as my peer, I'm still being acknowledged for what I did do. And I think they're able to make that connection very clearly. And after so many students and after so much time of the machine standing here in the corner proudly, is the excitement just continued to just happen every single year where kids come in and they're like, oh yeah, the machine is still here. The program is still in place. I'm going to get more books if I read. Absolutely. They love the machine. It never dies. I have one student in particular who does not fill out a reading log per month. He does 10, five to 10 per month. Um, And he's been doing that for the past two years. And one of the things that keeps the excitement going is every year we get a new cohort of pre-k and kindergarten students so the book vending machine concept is completely new to them right so every year we launch this, we launch the principal's reading challenge in september each each month if the due date for the reading log is the 30th i have students i have parents saying we missed the due date but here's our law can we still get the book so there's a great deal of buy-in uh, connected to it the the machine does the marketing for us for the students, right? Because they I've had students who said, you know what, I didn't do my book I didn't do my book lock this month, Mr. Barnes, but can I please have a book? I've had parents bring their kids back to me in July because they forgot to turn their book their their uh, log in at the end of June, and now they're on summer vacation, and mom is like. She is just driving me crazy. Will you please give her a book? <laughs> and that's what we want. Um, we're never going to turn a kid down from a book, but what we want is we want them to be reflective. So I, like I said, I've had a student that said, I did not do the log this month, but I want to read. That's what we want. <laughs> and that sounds you know, just like the strong community you have built here in this school, knowing that, yeah, I missed the deadline, but I still want that book. Can we do it? In a lot of cases, maybe some of those students get turned away, but not here that also has to make the community students, parents, everyone feel really good about coming to, to School 61. I like to believe so, and I hope so. Our, our theme here is we are family, so we try to make sure that our actions align to that. So when Global Vending, you know, updated this wonderful book vending machine, we were so, so, so grateful and it's so aligned to our theme of we are family because it was such a generous uh, family-like uh, a donation, and it really helped us to bring our, our building theme full circle. Because the students came this year, and they knew the book vending machine was going to be here, but they didn't know it was going to look like this. Sure. Okay. <laughs> is the success with the readers that are really into it and doing all these logs, is that infectious to other students who may be kind of on the fence with their reading and the struggles that they're having? It is, because some of the t- some things that we will see is we will see some of our more enriched readers They'll get a book out of the book vending machine, and let's say their school bus is coming late, and it's going to be 30 minutes late, and they're sitting on the steps with me, and in the winter, it's dark at 5 p.m. They're opening up that book, and they may be reading that book as a third grader to a kindergartner who can't read, or another third grader who may not be as strong of a reader, so they still get to benefit from it. So it also builds relationships amongst the Mm -hmm. students, and it builds a love of reading that way, if I'm not necessarily the strongest reader, or if I not nece- or if I didn't bring in the log because the dog ate it or what have you, I still get to benefit from my peer that did, and, and that really builds a community of readers, which is what we want. Exactly. So, the, and the, that just continues to to grow every year, especially with returning students who know the programs here. There's excitement there. There's excitement for the new students who look at it and go, "Oh, I can be a part of that too." Absolutely. What else are you doing outside of the book vending machine? I know that you have 
some things that you're doing personally every month Mm -hmm. um, to, again, encourage the reading at home. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the the other things that you're doing? Sure. We're we're doing a variety, and I'll I'll share one. So one of the things that we're doing is we do um, what's called the once a month read aloud with the bow tie principle. So that's what I reckon. That's what I identify myself as here at the school as the bow tie principle. So we have a robust website and social media presence. So on our Facebook Live, the first Monday of every month, what we do is we select three children title books, and we send out a Google survey to our families, and they can select which book they would like to be as the read aloud, and the book with the most votes as the read aloud. So the first Monday of each month at 7 p.m., I go live on Facebook. I'm from our school library, sometimes from my living room because we are family and we want students to feel comfortable. And um, I engage them in a read aloud. And in that read aloud, um, the parents join the Facebook. Uh, they put their children's names in the chat as they join. I'm able to greet the children. Um, That's and, great. What, and what we do is it's an, another opportunity for me to build uh, students' um, literacy capacity, if you will, because we, we do a think aloud, really. So when we talk about a think aloud, we talk we make predictions by looking at the title, what the story may be about. We look at the pictures. We we bring out certain vocabulary words, right? Um, it help. We, we make inferences. We go back and we you know we when we were on page two of the story, we asked this question. When we got to the end, was it answered? Um, it gives students an opportunity to put emojis in the chat. If you like this part, show me a heart. You know, if this made you sad, give me an orange face. So it's a way for parents and students to interact virtually wherever they may be at the homework table or driving home from soccer. And that goes back to what I said, where we have to come up with innovative ways to engage families. So I may be a parent that I cannot get to the school during the school day because I'm working, but I can log on to Facebook in the car while my high school students at soccer practice with my eight-year-old and engage in the read aloud. So that's what I'm referencing when we're talking about innovative ways to get students and families um, involved and uh, build a sense of buy-in connected to reading so that there's a a generic, authentic love for for the act of reading, if you will. What other kinds of activities have you implemented through uh, the literacy programs that are happening here? Oh, sure. So as I shared, we do the mystery reader once per month. Yeah, that's great. Where the parents can come into the classroom and they can read to the children. Um, In addition to the mystery reader, we have what's called a JEDI initiative here. Um, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion is all over our website. So we have a different theme of inclusivity for every month of the year. So for uh, January, the theme is physical disabilities. So we have an author of the month board. So the author we select is an author that's reflective who has overcome or is successful in spite of a a physical disability. Sure. And then we select a book... or title from that author to be our read aloud of the month. So now we are also exposing children to books that incorporate, you know, uh, characters, if you will, who have disabilities. So what that does is it teaches students acceptance and mm-hmm. tolerance. And then that spills over into our arts department program because our arts teachers then expose students to, this is a visual artist who's had a disability. This is a, uh, a singer who's had a disability. This is an actor in their theater class who's had a disability, right? And then when their teachers, if their teachers choose to engage the students in that read aloud, they're able to say, oh, that person has a physical bis- disability. And we've learned about that in our various disciplines. Uh, we, we, we know about that because we've seen that on the author of the month board. So now that gives them something if they're reading independently at home, maybe, you know, the, t- the story that they're reading says, you know, and Jay was once upon a time in a wheelchair, and they're able to say, oh, he had a physical disability at one point, and they're able to make a connection. And what it really does is it maximizes their comprehension. So, it's- so uh, th- that cross-curriculum through different classes really reinforces the ubiquity of reading and lets every student know that reading isn't just the library. Reading isn't just when I go home and, and, and get my books and that sort of thing. They're going to be doing it in every facet of their life, pretty much. Absolutely, in every facet of their life. So we try to give them opportunities to engage in reading in ways that are not um, intimidating because reading to perform a task is a thing, and it's what the state uses to determine who's proficient. So we have to, so we have to read, but no one said that it doesn't have to be fun. So we try to come up with ways that reading is fun and we try to incentivize and recognize students for reading 
um, so that when they have to perform the standardized test, the building level test, the in-class assessments, it's it's nothing for them. It's just more reading. Um, so it has worked, and we continue to take we plan to continue to take that approach moving forward. How important is it to mix up those genres to really keep that interest level going? Where it's not just you know we're coming in or we're reading these set books. There are books that they have to read, as you mentioned, and there are books that they can read for fun. But there's also other materials that they need to to keep that cadence up of different subjects that they have to read about. How important is that in their in their the way that they're going through school? It's very important because reading is confirmed based on experience, right? So if I read something that says if you put a seed in the ground and you water it out comes a plant, that's confirmed when I do that, right? So when we're talking about the content areas of science and social studies, um, that really gives students an opportunity to read, particularly science, and do to confirm their understanding or comprehension. So having a variety of titles and genres is vital in order to give students an opportunity to read things that they can or have experienced. So one of the things that we try to be strategic about with the book vending machine in particular is making sure it is not just randomly putting titles in, but for an example, if it's February, we're trying to put a lot of culturally relevant books in. Sure. Right. Um, if it is um, April or May, we're coming up on Earth Day, we try to put a lot of books in that may be connected to gardening and planting and the the environment, right? We, um, we try to make sure that we have books that are cross-curricular focus, so the books that are science-focused, books that are social studies-focused, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, as well as a balance of fiction and nonfiction text. So students um, have a wide range of text that's available to them because we want to also make sure there's equity in regards to what children are reading. You know, If they're only reading um, fiction picture books, uh, it doesn't help uh, them become familiar with multiple genres. It doesn't help them with tolerance. It doesn't help them with acceptance. And it doesn't help them with content knowledge. So we, we try to be very strategic and intentional about that. When you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the reading, what you're reading aloud, the Bowtie Principles, reading this book, and that instant feedback you get with the emojis in the chat, talk a little bit about the not-so-instant feedback that you've gotten from the parents in the community about having the book machine as part of uh, what the kids are going to be doing at school? Yeah, the parents, they, they love the book. I, so one of the good things about the, the live is if I work 3 to 11 and I'm not with my child, it's there, and I can access it with him or her the next day or when I'm not at work, right? So I get a lot of feedback um, after the fact for folks that are not necessarily on live, right? Um, We've had families join that are not a part of our throw eve. So they'll say, you know, how do you use that? Because they probably don't have a book vending machine at their school. Sure. Right. Um, I've had parents say, you know, um, <laughs> can my kid get a book out of there? Because we have parents who they may be a parent of a pre-K student or a kindergarten student. So we're in the first four months of the school year. So they're relatively new. So their schedules may not have allowed them to become as cust accustomed to our initiatives right. as other parents. Right. But then again, that live was a platform because they're like, you're doing this read aloud and you're sitting in front of this book vending machine. So what's that about? Or I came and did a tour at the school and I saw that book vending machine. So now what does that mean to Joey who's actually going there, right? And what we really see is the children going home and telling their parents about the book vending machine. And you, you got a sign here. You got to sign here so that I can get a coin, you know, and then parents are coming and saying, what is this that they keep bringing me this log that they're adamant that I sign? Show me. So now we have parents in the building. So it works for multiple goals of an optimal school, if you will. <laughs> sure. And we've talked a lot about, you know, during the school year, those summer months can be a little bit tougher to keep kids' attentions going with the things that they're reading or actually getting them to read. What kind of things are you doing to make sure that that love of reading is not falling stagnant over those months that they're not actually coming to school? Yes. Well, we um, send home what's called a summer learning enrichment packet. We do one for the content area of ELA and one for the content area of math. As it relates to just authentic reading, because I want to get under a tree in the shade on a sunny day and read, um, our literacy coach has a robust page where we have a uh, activities and book titles recommended. 
And it goes back to our Jedi initiative. So our Jedi initiative, if you go to our website, for an example, it will say for January, these are the titles. These are, we're focusing on physical disability. But then we have a book list of titles of children's books that embraces physical disabilities that parents can click on and it reads it to them and their child, right? Uh, this here new reading with the bow tie principle that has started at the beginning of the school year, we're going to continue that over the summer this year. So our students who don't see us in July and August, they'll still be able to see us virtually and be connected reading. So they're ready to hit the ground running in September. So we're excited about that. With everything in technology changing so much, and we've talked about innovation, what do you see coming down the pipeline as other possible forays to delve into to keep kids interested in reading other than just picking up a book in the library. What else is going on in education to maybe use other forms of technology that we haven't used in the past? So that's it, technology, technology, technology. So the next few years, you're going to see all state tests across the state transition to fully online. There will be no more paper and pen, uh, you know. So I see uh, technology, technology, technology having a very big presence um, in what it looks like when kids read. Um, moving forward, I can confirm that as it relates to the reading that students have to do to perform a task because sure. the state tests are transitioning to online. Right. So I see technology having a very, very heavy presence um, as it relates to the reading I have to do to show that I am a reader for the state is online. So we're going to have to um, strike some semi of a balance when we are asking students to read that they're having that opportunity to do so online. So for an example, one of the uh, platforms we have access to uh, with our district is called Mayan, which is an online reading platform that there's several books. But we're going to have to be careful that we strike a balance and don't dismiss a book in the hand, right? So we, we're in a texting generation. We're in a 21st century. Everything is technology and everything is online. But we really want to be careful that a child still can write a friendly letter. Right, so that's going to be our job as education practitioners to ensure that we are relevant, but that we don't inadvertently uh, do anything that results in students losing skills that we have always uh, uh, nurtured or massaged, if you will. Sure. Do other principals of other buildings come up to you and say, hey, I don't have one of those? It's really interesting what you're doing over there. What are the kinds of things that you tell them as other leaderships or, or persons of leadership um, in, in their schools and in their districts? Right. I have really a lot of uh, school leaders and district leaders from other school systems reach out to me, some suburban locally and several from um, different states. Because like I said, we have a, a robust uh, social media presence. So we post our book bending machine days each month and when we post that, like on our Facebook or our, or our LinkedIn, I've gotten I've gotten several um, correspondences, which my predecessor warned me. She goes, "You're going to get inundated with this," <laughs> and oh boy, was she correct. But I get several correspondences in regards to, you know, where did you get this from? How does this look? What does this look like? How does it work? How have you done it in your school? So I get several of those correspondences. Uh, so much so where I kind of have a standard response drafted. So when I get it, it takes me five seconds as opposed to 10 minutes per person. But I've had several inquiries over the past two years. And it was really interesting because when Mrs. Walker and her former assistant principal, Dr. Robinson, put this in place over five years ago, she was inundated. And I, I came along in 2021. And now in 2024, I still get those correspondences. So it is, it, it, it is I think, an epiphany to schools uh, because I think everyone's mind is cultured around how a vending machine is supposed to be used, but when sure. they see books in it, they're like, so what is, what are the initiatives connected to that, that gets that book to fall out of the, the, the holder and, and into the child's hand. And, um, I'm, I'm happy to share that information. <laughs> sure. And we will actually make sure that we have all the ways that people can uh, get a hold of you if they have any questions, but it's been wonderful to sit down and talk Likewise. with you. It's great to see you again. Thank you. It's great to see this wonderful inchy bookworm yes. book vending machine behind us still. Yes getting its love from the kids and from everyone in the community here at, at the yes, Arthur O'Leary School. It. I've had, I, I happened to do a walkthrough the other day and I saw a kid in the library run up to the machine and hug it. So <laughs> it is a part of our family to say the least. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and where can we find you, uh, you personally online if folks do want to reach out and, and get in contact with you? Yes. So, um, 
my 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 profession my work email is in Byron's at buffaloschools.org. Anyone can email me. And we also have a, a school Facebook, which is our Throat Youth School of Distinction. If you type that into the search engine of Facebook, our school page will come up. So any of those platforms are okay. And I also can be reached by calling the school at 716-816-3400. Have a dynamic office staff who shares with me all correspondences. And if anyone reached out, I'd be happy to share information. Awesome. Principal Barnes, it's so good to see you. Thanks Likewise. so much for being on The Reading Revolution. Thank you. Thanks.